There's always one, isn't there? All right. Jolly good. Any kids in the back? Couple? Yeah, they haven't quite learned the Bethel ways yet, yeah. So if you would like, from now on, girls, you can sit closer to the front so you can participate a little bit better. And then, um, and then you go sit with your parents afterwards. So, so put your books down. Pay attention, because I've got a couple questions for you. What happens when you don't look after something? Like you get lost? Yeah, if you don't look after it, you break it. Yeah? Somebody might take it and do what? Oh, and buy it? I suppose, yeah. Sure, sure. What happens if you never ever cut, wash, or comb your hair? Ever. Like ever. What would happen? Dirty and greasy, yeah? Turns pink and green. <laughs> so moldy and gross, yeah? It would go up into heaven? Well, maybe eventually. Uh, what would happen if you never, ever, 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 ever washed yourself? You would be dirty and stinky, wouldn't you? Yeah. You would turn, you'd turn into a troll. Well, you would look and smell like one, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you'd look like Shrek. Does he never t what, take a bath? <laughs> right. Well, that's what I mean when I say what happens if you don't look after something, you don't take care of it. It gets gross, doesn't it? It gets horrible. But when you do look after something, when you take care of something, what does that say about the thing that you're taking care of? Okay, it keeps growing and growing. Good, it means nothing bad would happen. It's healthy, yes. Okay, okay, then you wouldn't die. I think when you look after something, when you take care of it, it means that that thing is valuable to you, right? Because you're willing to look after it. Do you think you're valuable to your mom and dad? Are you worth something to them? That should be an easy one, guys. <laughs> do, do your mom and dad look after you? I know they do. I know they look after you. And it's because you are valuable to them that they look after you. <sighs> if you're looking after something and you're taking care of it, does that mean that that thing needs you? Do you need your mom and dad? Yes. Yeah, you do. How many? Yes, you do. I promise you, you do. If, if all of a sudden... You woke up in the morning and there was no adults in your house at all and they never came back. You'd be in big trouble, wouldn't you? Who would turn on the PlayStation? <laughs> that would be awful, wouldn't it? No, it shows that you need them. That's right. Well, today, during the sermon time, while you're drawing in your books and doing that sort of stuff, keep an ear out because I'm going to talk about how Jesus... And his father look after and take care of us. And some of the things that we mentioned here this morning are going to be mentioned again. So they'll sound familiar. Right. Came prepared today with sweets. All right. So very quickly, take a sweet, take a sweet. And then go find your parents. Get your books. Get your pencils. Get crayons. There you go. Just take one. Just take one. Take one. Take one. Take one. Quick, 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 quick. Quick like a bunny. Quick, quick, quick. Arabella, take one. Take it, take it, take it. Oh, lucky. All right, quick, 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 quick. Five, four, three. Yes, you are a kid. Here you go, buddy. 
Here you go. Here you go. Oh, goodness. All right. Make your way to your parents. Our scripture reading this morning is found in John chapter 15. We'll be looking at verses 2 to 8. May was on the schedule to read. Do we have Jan going to do it for us? Thank you, Jan. John chapter 15, verses 2 to 8. So John 15, 2 to 8. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears Oh, that, is that right? That bears much fruit. Yeah. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Amen. Thank you, Jan. Right. So we've been talking about the vine. And we've got our, uh, our vine here. He's, he's looking a little frazzled around the edges. But I think that's because that's the time of the year. Not necessarily because of what's going on with him. We're going to keep him out for another week or so for next week. And then we're going to plant him somewhere in the back. And if anybody knows the best places to plant grape vines, I'll, uh, I'll leave that up to you. Um, and maybe at some point in the future, we'll get some grapes off of it. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Right. What are some ways that you look after your garden? What are some ways that you look after your garden? We're going to let the adults answer this one. All right. Yes. Watering it. Yes. Especially when we're having a drought and it's not getting much rain. Kaylee. Weaning and pruning, pulling things out. Is it? Go ahead. The right soil. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it interesting that the way we look after something is to take things off of it, to take things away from it, like the weeds. Or even sometimes the flowers have to be cut back, don't they? Um, and what is the result of that? What happens as a result of us taking care of our garden in that way? New growth. New growth, yep, yeah, absolutely. Would you say controlled growth? Because if we didn't do anything, it will still grow, but not the way in which we want. So it's what we would call controlled growth. And if you don't look after it, it becomes a mess, doesn't it? You know, I was driving around Roland's Castle the other day. I was taking the long way to church, um, which I do sometimes. And it'll, I, I take about a 20 minute drive before I get here just to kind of relax and chill and stuff. And I was just driving through Roland's Castle and I ended up in an area that I haven't been to, believe it or not. I don't spend a lot of time driving around Roland's Castle, um, but everybody always talks about the big fancy houses and I've not really ever seen too many of them. But I ended up on this road with huge, huge, enormous houses set way back off the end and, and huge places and big gardens and, and big circular driveways and big fancy cars. And as I, as I was driving along, I noticed how manicured they are and how, how beautiful they are until I got to one house. Now, this house was just as big as all the other ones. And the garden was just as big. The, the car was just as fancy but they hadn't done anything to their garden. And, and there, was, there was tall grass, this, this tall, all over the place. And it was, it was totally unkempt. And I thought, that's really odd. It's so out of place. Their garden was still growing, probably more so than the other ones, but it just looked a mess. Now, it could be that they've taken that... Um, Oh, there's this, uh, the council has decided they're only going to mow 
the council areas like twice a year now because they're doing it in the name of ecology so that you know I think they're just trying to save money but they they think that uh, if you let things grow then habitats and and natural things grow and it could be that was what was going on with this house in Rollins but at the end of the day it still looks a mess um, and it, it still reflects in our culture it reflects on the person who's looking after it doesn't it well I'm going to talk very quickly this morning through our passage. What is the work of the vine and the vine dresser? The work of the vine and the vine dresser. The first thing I want to look at is the purpose for God's caretaking. The purpose for God's caretaking. And it's found in verse 8. By this, my father is glorified. By what? By this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples I'm starting out with the most important thing that you're going to hear all day this may be one of the most important things you ever hear in your entire life as a Christian whatever the vine and the vine dresser Jesus and the father whatever they do only have one purpose and that is to bring glory to the Father. Throughout his ministry, Jesus explained over and over and over again, even though he was God himself, he said, everything I do, I do for the Father. I do it at his will, and I do it for his glory. We know that everything God does, he does for his glory. Why did he send Jesus? He sent him because I needed him, but that wasn't the only purpose. In fact, that wasn't the major purpose. The major purpose was because it would bring glory to the Father. Why did Jesus cleanse me from sin? Surely because I needed it. Yes, but that's not the only reason. He created me in the first place to bring glory to him. And the only way that was going to happen is by me being cleansed from my sin. So everything he does, he does to bring glory to himself. This is possibly the most misunderstood aspect of our relationship with God. The fact that it is not about us. It is always about Him. If we could get that into our heads and let it stay there, I think it would radically change how we interact with God. How we respond to the things that He does. How often do we pray for God to stop doing what he's doing? Now, we don't do it on purpose. But when God brings something into our life, when he starts doing some pruning, we say, God, please stop that. Please take away this issue. Please, please stop this struggle. Please, please heal me. No, I'm not saying that that's wrong to do that because we're asking God for guidance in that but let's make sure that that is truly what we're doing and let's make sure that every time we ask God to do something that we are asking him to do it for his glory because chances are the thing that has come about in your life is there for his glory and too often we ask God Lord would you stop being glorified in me that's in essence what we are asking God to do how often do we ask God to change his laws of nature for us? We talked about this some weeks ago, how the laws of nature are put there by God. And when nature responds to his laws, he is glorified. One of the, one of the most important ones to remember that is, is a key throughout the entire Bible is whatever you sow, you will reap. And if you sow mischief, and trouble and discourse, that's what you're going to reap. To ask God to, to stop that is basically to ask God to stop being glorified. He's glorified when nature responds to his natural laws. If we spend all our money on rubbish and get to the end of the month and then say, God, would you provide for me? Would you look after me? The law of nature says if you give it all away, if you spend it all, you don't have it anymore. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. That's what that means. 
And we ask God to violate his own laws of nature. How often are we disappointed when God is blessing other people? And I put that in inverted commas. But he's not blessing us. And maybe we don't do it openly because that wouldn't be very good. But we do it inwardly. Lord, why are you giving them so much? How come you're doing this for them? How come, how come this person gets to be 75 years old and they're still healthy and playing golf all the time? <laughs> and, and here I am, only 70, and I'm laid up in the hospital. How come, how come they always seem to fall on their feet? And they're getting raises at work, and they, they're always getting good stuff, and I, I don't like, I'm barely keeping a job down. And sometimes in our heads, we ask God, or at least we think things like this. God, why are you doing that to them and not to me? It's just not fair. It's not right. Because we have got our relationship with him mixed up. We think he's there to make our life better. When actually we're simply here to bring glory to him. And however he chooses to do that in his garden, which is all of us, is exactly the way it should be done. We need to get, ourselves, get our eyes off of our own selves and put them back on the vine and back on the vine dresser. I think three things will happen if we do that. Number one, we'll become less angry and confused as Christians. We'll become less angry and confused as Christians. If we stop looking at our own self and what God is doing in our hearts and, and criticize him for it, criticize him for the things he's doing in our life and just accept that this is for your glory Lord I, I, I'm not sure I like being pruned but if that's what brings glory to you then yeah we'll become less angry and confused if we get our, our eyes off of ourselves and put them on him number two we'll become more joyful and praising I don't know many people May, if you're watching, you're one of the people I do know that often responds this way. No matter what is going on, her comments are PTL. Praise the Lord. I don't know why, and it's a bit of a struggle, but I'm not going to focus on that. Praise the Lord. And that needs to be our attitude. I don't know why this thing is happening in my life. I don't know why my relationships are always a mess. Well, we might know that. If, the, if you're the common denominator in all of your broken relationships. But that notwithstanding, when things are coming to us and they're obviously from God, and if we would just accept that, then we could say, PTL, praise the Lord. And number three, we'll be, number one, we're less angry and confused. Number two, we're more joyful and praising. And number three, we will become more like Jesus. And guess what that is? That is what the definition of producing fruit is. Just like a well-kept garden reflects well on the person looking after it. That's what God is going to do in your life. He will be glorified. And he's got a couple of different ways he's going to do that, which we're going to look at in just a minute. No. God does all things for his glory, not because he's a narcissist. If we did everything for our glory, if everything was about us, we would be a narcissist. But that's not why God does it. He does it because every single thing in creation, whether it be alive or inanimate, whether it be the creation itself or animals or you or me, every single part of God's creation is created for a purpose and that is to bring glory to him. Even the parts that completely and totally rebel against him were created for his glory. And they only know the full sense of their being, the acceptance, the peace, and the joy. They can only fully accept that when they are bringing most glory to God. It's not because God is a narcissist. It's because he knows we need it. We need to know that we are bringing glory to him. And then we will say, 
Praise the Lord. Regardless of what it is. The Father has a plan and He has a purpose for His garden. For every single one of you. So let's look at the practice of what that is. What that actually looks like. First of all, he will do whatever is necessary to help the branches produce fruit. He will do whatever is necessary to help the branches produce fruit. Now, I'm going to pause because I want to explain the first part of verse 2. It says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, actually, at least two of you have come to me in the last couple of weeks asking what this means or demonstrating uh, what you think this means. And, and what I want to do is I want to present a couple of viewpoints about what this means, okay? The first, the first part of this, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, can be interpreted in one of two ways. Each of those ways is a biblical way of understanding it. Each of those ways of understanding that first part has its root in the passage. Okay? So, whichever way you choose to, to interpret that first part, you are on good solid ground. And it, is, it doesn't affect any other doctrines. The main difference is whether every branch in me that does not bear fruit takes away, he takes away belongs with the rest of verse 2, or if it belongs with verse 6. Let me read verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burnt. So it could be that verse 2 is actually sort of an introduction to this whole little section here. So in other words, verse 2 is explaining that there are two types of branches, some that abide and some that don't, some that will get thrown away, and some that get pruned, or it could have a different meaning. And that's what I'm going to, I'll give you the other one in a minute. So the taking away, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That little phrase, taking away, is this, is, 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 if we go by the first view, is the same as the being thrown away and being burned. Those are describing the same thing. Um, it is judgment. It is hell. It is the weeding out of false branches. And there are definitely people who claim to be disciples, but aren't really disciples, aren't there? In Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven... On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Another example is Judas. Judas was, was chosen. He was sent. He even performed miracles. And then he was proclaimed the son of perdition. Because he had never truly been born again. And that's what this verse, first view says. Is that there are some who are in the vine, in the church. They claim the name, but they have not truly believed in their hearts. So this is not teaching, this first view does not teach that if you get saved and become a Christian, but then choose to be a bad Christian, that you lose your salvation. It's not teaching that. It's, it, it is not interfering with the doctrine of eternal security. But it's saying that there are people who say they're Christians. And they're really not. And Jesus will judge them. The other possibility is that every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. Is actually a second group of people who are Christians, okay? So, in other words, verse 2 would be describing two different groups of people. Some who produce fruit, they're truly born again, but they don't produce fruit. And some who are truly born again, and they do produce fruit. We might say that they're struggling to produce fruit, but whatever the reason is, they're not producing fruit. Now, let me give you some 
background on this point of view. The Greek word that is in our English takes away, the Greek word is aero. A-I-R-O. And it's where we get our word air. And it means to lift up or to raise. Just like air does. Let me show you just three of about 40 different places in the New Testament where this word is used. Matthew 4, 6. And he said to them, if you are, this is the devil. This is the devil talking to Jesus. He said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will, and there's the word, bear you up. Lest you strike your foot against the stone. In Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In Luke 17, 13, and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. That's the same word that we find. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, is the way it's translated in English. It actually is lifted up. Now, it can be translated as take away, but most of the time, it's translated as lifted up. And in fact, if we go to the end, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it, that it, the word it, is not in the Greek. So it could be it or they. It could be they. They may bear more fruit. So it could be that these are actually two different groups of people who are in Christ. Some are bearing fruit and some are not bearing fruit. If these two groups are people who truly are in Christ, then they're not the group mentioned in verse 6. I know I'm probably losing some of you, but I'm going to summarize very quickly, all right? In this group, there would be one group, a branch in the vine, but they're not bearing fruit. In other words, they're not very much resembling Jesus. They have been born again, but they don't look much like Jesus. So, according to that passage, if this is the true way, the vine dresser comes along and he lifts them up. Now, how many have, of you have ever seen a vineyard and you go through there and the, vein, the vines are all lifted up and tied to trellises? Because given themselves, if they just do their own thing, that's what they do. And then they grow across the ground. And guess what? Those ones on the ground never produce fruit. Now, I believe in the second view that this is what Jesus does. He ties them up. So they get access to the sun. So they get more nutrients. And then they start producing fruit. That's my view, viewpoint. Group two is a group that's in the vine. And they're producing fruit. And he snips them back. So that they produce more fruit. Both of these views. Whichever view you take. That they're not really believers. And so they are judged and cast into hell. Even though they say those things. Is, or if you believe the other view. Both of those views are biblical. And both of those views can be backed up with scripture. And both of those views come out of this text. So we're not reading into the text. So, so if whichever view you decide to take is perfectly fine. Doesn't interfere with eternal security or any of our other uh, doctrines. Again, I hold to the second view. But if you want to hold to the first, first view, we can still be friends. If you hold to the first view, you're friends with John Piper. If you hold to the second view, you can still be friends with John Piper as well. So let's go back to the text, all right? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. He does, the, the, the vine dresser does, whatever is necessary to help the branches produce fruit. Because that is how he is glorified. And that's the whole purpose of this garden in the first place. So he will do whatever is necessary in your life as a believer to help you produce fruit. He is not there to punish you. Jesus took your punishment. He is there to help you produce fruit 
And he will do that because, not because it's for your good, purely. That's one of the side effects. It is purely for his glory. And he will do whatever it takes. He helps us produce fruit, I believe, in the first place. Again, verse 2a, I believe, abide in me and I in you, or excuse me, and I in you. Uh, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And, uh, and I believe that is him lifting us up. Not taking away, but lifting us up. Verse 4, the second way, is by us abiding in him. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And number three, he does it by abiding in us. That is how we produce fruit. But he also helps us produce more fruit. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. But he also does it, he also does it by getting rid of the non-producing branches. Possibly two-way, if that's your view, then that's what that's teaching. Certainly, verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. When we first moved into the manse, in the back corner, there was what appeared to be a great big tree. Now, as it turns out, this tree was completely rotten and there was nothing left of it. It was being completely held together by vines, by ivy. And that ivy was so thick and it had grown up around the root and across the branches and, and there was literally nothing left of the tree except rotten wood in the middle. But these vines were holding it together. You would look at that and you would think, boy, that's a lovely tree. No, it wasn't. And when you took away the vines, there was nothing there. And I think there are times in our... in, in church life where there are people who claim to be part of the body but they're not because their hearts are not abiding they've never trusted and once that's removed there's nothing left in there well I'm going to jump to the applications because I am determined to be finished on time today and I need you to pay attention to this bit, all right? Everybody paying attention? Everybody sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. Of primary importance, above all else, you need to take this away. Have you been cleansed by Jesus? Verse 3 says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Is that true in your life? Whether you're sitting here and you're 5 or 50 or... Do we have anyone over 75? All right. Oh, Jeff's over 75. We have a new oldie in the group. <laughs> Whatever your age is this morning, you need to answer this question. Have you been cleansed? by the blood of Jesus? Have you trusted him? Have you actually been grafted onto the vine so that his blood now courses through your veins? His pure and holy and righteous blood. Have you acknowledged and responded to Jesus' choosing, appointing and going? Maybe you are a believer. Have you, have you accepted the fact that by putting your faith and trust in Jesus means that you are now his? And he's got a plan for you. He's got work for you to do. And that work is not just to make your life better. It's to bring glory to him. Or are you still calling the shots? Are you still like those brambles? That if they would just stay in their nice bush. And they would just be pruned back. They would produce beautiful blackberries. But given to their own devices. They go everywhere and anywhere. And all they are is a hassle and a bloom and pain in the neck. Is that how Jesus would view your life? I just want to go over here, Lord. I just want to see what's going on over here. Don't cut me back. Don't keep me in the bush. I want to explore. I want to spread my wings. I want to see what this life has to offer. Are you producing fruit? In other words, are you becoming like Jesus daily? 
by abiding. In other words, remaining or resting, living in Jesus. Are his thoughts your thoughts? Are his ways your ways? Are his goals your goals? Are his priorities your priorities? That's what it means to abide. And that's what it means to produce fruit. Because as you abide, you become just like him. By abiding in his love. Just resting in the fact that whatever he's doing is, is out of love for you. Jesus says, those whom I love, I scourge. That's a little bit of King James for you there, Dave. Not because he hates them, but because he loves them. And abiding in that means you accept what he is doing in your life. By obeying his commandments. Number one, to love each other. And number two, to love him above all else. And are you doing all of this in his power? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Don't be one of those that, well, I go to church, so therefore I'm a Christian. That's not, that's not abiding in his power. Abiding in his power says, Lord, I just desperately want to worship you. And I love worshiping you with my brothers and sisters as well. So as we prepare to close with a couple of songs, I want you to take a minute to think about how the Father might be pruning you. You've put your trust in Christ. You've, you've accepted the challenge he's given you. You're producing fruit, becoming like Jesus. And then he comes along and brings you challenges. Then he comes along and does things to you. He calls it pruning. We call it trials. He calls it bringing glory to me. We call it pain and suffering. Because from the, from the vine's point of view, if I go over there and start trimming and pruning, the vine's like, ow! I liked that. You didn't have to cut that off. The vine says, wait, I don't want to go over there. Don't tie me up on this trellis. Let me go my way. And so to us, things look very different than they do to the vine dresser. So take a minute and think, how are you responding to that? By allowing things into our life, the Father does, that will test us and consequently grow us. Maybe a health issue. It might be a relationship issue. It might be a work-related issue. It might be some stupid appliance in your house that never works. It may be a failure on the MOT. It may be an unexpected bill. It may be, it could be a hundred different things that God is going to use to prune you so that you can bring forth more fruit. It could be an ongoing issue. Remember Paul's thorn in the flesh? That was pruning. So that God would be glorified. And they all have one purpose. To bring him glory. And thereby prove that you are his disciples. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you. You prepare your hearts for worship. It might be that during the songs, you might need to just spend some time praying and asking God to readjust your, your responses to him. It might be if you're sitting here this morning that you've never actually been grafted, but you're ready to be. You're ready to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Why not do that today? Why, why not just... Seek someone out in the church and say, I would love to accept Christ as my Savior today. I want to start this relationship with him. I feel like I'm empty inside, and it's because he's missing. And if that's the case, can I encourage you? Can I beg you? Can I implore you from the bottom of my heart? Don't walk away from this building without taking care of that. It is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. To trust Christ as Savior.
So wherever you are this morning, whether you're outside and need to be inside, or whether you're inside and need to be producing more fruit, let's respond to him in the way that he's calling us. Father, thank you for this amazing example of what it means to be in Christ. Lord, would you work in our hearts this morning, whatever our need is, would you be glorified? Would you show us and teach us in our, in our own heart and in our own mind right now how we need to respond to you? Father, do away with our stubbornness and our pride, our self-centeredness. And Father, strip us of all the things that are preventing us from bringing glory to you. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here this morning, from a young child up to the most mature of us, that needs to accept Jesus as Savior, we've never actually put our trust in him. Lord, would you show them that need this morning? Would you save their souls? Redeem their hearts? And give them new life? And for those that have been not responding correctly to your pruning, Father, would you break us again of that pride and self-centeredness so that we can bring glory to you. Thank you, Lord, for this. Help us as we sing. Help us to respond to your word as you see fit. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.